If you spend any amount of time around a campfire and enjoy grilled food, the natural question is, how could I cook on this thing? Well, today we're cooking on solo stove and Brio fire pits, and it's going to be hot. I'll admit it, I love playing with fire. I love making fires, sitting around fires, stoking fires, but most of all, I love cooking with fire. That's why initially I was bummed when I got my Solo Stove Yukon for Christmas. I didn't have a way to cook on it other than using hot dogs on a stick. Now that all changed when Solo Stove released their cooking system where we can grill, griddle, and even walk over an open fire. Now Brio also offers their outpost grill and sear plate griddle, and we have both in the lab today for a head to head. So these are both testing models that were sent to us by Brio and Solo Stove. We asked if we could test them, they sent them to us, and here are the rules. There's no proofing of this content by either brand. No brand notes, no guidance, or talking points. We're not getting paid by the brands, and our thoughts are our own. Now, the only way we make money on this video is if anyone clicks our links below and decides to make a purchase. Now, we have affiliate links for both products, so with all of that said, let's compare some apples to apples. First up, let's talk grills. We've got the Solo Stove Hub that rests on top of the Solo Stove Bonfire, making it so we have a place for the grill top. The hub is made of 304 stainless steel, and you can see that it's already gotten quite a workout from us cooking with it. Now the measurement for the top is 14 and a half inches, and on the bottom it's just shy of 19 inches. The height measurement is eight inches from top to bottom, and it weighs three pounds, so it's very light compared to the cooktops. Now the grill is a little shy of 18 inches across and weighs 17 pounds. It's made of cast iron, so you know that it's made to sear. The Brio Outpost Grill attaches to the fire pit, and we have the new Y series here, and you just place the outpost rod into the top of the fire pit and snap it in. Now, you can also take the outpost grill and stake it right into the ground, so it's designed for either purpose, but today, since we have the Y-Series, we're gonna go ahead and put it in the slot it's designed for. Now, the outpost grill is designed to lock it at any height on the rod, like an Argentinian grill would. Now, the grill itself that fits this Y-Series is called the Outpost 19, and it's 17 inches wide and weighs just under 11 pounds. In a minute, we'll show you all of the test cooks we did on both of these grills, but before we do, we need to cover fire management and how to get a fire going that is good to cook over with these fire pits. Now with either of these cooking systems, you're going to want a fire that is burned down to coals rather than trying to cook over a raging fire. Now the first challenge when cooking with flames lapping at the cooking surface is that it's just too hot. Trying to put something on the grill without burning off all of your arm hair is more than tricky, and these grill tops will allow fire through to incinerate your food if you're not careful. Now my recommendation is to build a fire like you normally would and get both fire pits to smokeless. Now once you have it hot enough to eliminate the smoke, about roughly six splits of wood, let it burn down to where the flames are below the top of the fire pit, and then put on the grills to heat up. By the time the wood is burned down to coals, your grill top will be ready to use and you shouldn't be in danger of being burned by the flames. Now there are of course times where you need to add more wood for longer cooking sessions and it's a bit more difficult with the solo stove hub. The gap where I can add firewood is five inches high, so that's one of the first things I want to point out about this setup. In order to keep the fire going, you're going to need to add wood and you're going to want splits that are cut to fit this opening. I have a few ricks of wood here on my patio, and this wood is all cut from 14 to 18 inches long. Now that's really too long to use with the cooking system on top. Seven to nine inch logs is what I'd recommend when cooking with a solo stove, and about the diameter of your forearm is a good width to plan for. The challenge is adding enough wood that the top stays at cooking temperature without under or over shooting. Now that's been our challenge. We'll add one or two small splits of wood as the coals are dwindling, and it'll only get the top back up to 275 degrees. I'll add another split of wood, and all of a sudden we're running at 600 to 700 degrees. It's frustrating trying to keep a consistent temperature to cook on. Now the Brio suffers from the same problem since you want to cook over coals, but with the generous amount of air that's supplied to the fire, it's easy to overshoot the temp that you're going for. 
Now, when it comes to adding wood though, Brio is much easier in this aspect. You can move the grill top up or down if needed, but most of the time I have the grill up high enough that I can add a split of wood underneath without any difficulty. Here are a few of the cooks that we've done on each grill. Starting with the solo stove grill top, we've cooked achiote marinated chicken breasts and pineapple, which is one of the staple meals in our house during grilling season. Now this is the cook where we learned the most about the solo stove grill top. There's no oil in this marinade, so there was a little bit of sticking on the chicken when it came to the grate, but it still was delicious. Now the fire cooks so hot that you'll need to turn the chicken earlier than you would on a standard grill, and that's what encouraged the sticking. Now we tried some steaks next and found that the grill marks that the system puts on meat aren't very thick, but two smaller grill marks per bar of the grill. Now that's because each bar of the grate is a half circle that creates a channel working to keep the grease and drippings out of the fire. Now if you're cooking two to three rounds of meat, you'll likely end up with a pool of dripping on the bars depending on how hot the grill is running. Now we've also cooked brats on the grill and we put them on a little before the flames completely died out from the fire and they seared so hard that their skin split open almost immediately. Now, if you like a nice snappy skin on a brat, this did it, but we learned that the sweet spot for grilling is more coals than it is for wood that's still putting out short flames. Steak kebabs were next and those were easy as they could be. Just rotated the skewer every few minutes and we got some charred veggies and medium rare steak for dinner with a balsamic glaze reduction. Now the kids may not volunteer for vegetables all the time, but even they will acknowledge the charry grilled goodness of a steak kebab. For the Brio Outpost Grill, we tried many of the same meals on that unit as well. We cooked some Porter Road bratwurst, and while we say the skins on the brats burst on the Solo Stove Grill, we were able to move the Outpost Grill up five to six inches to give them more distance between the meat and the fire. None of the skins on the brats that we cooked over the Outpost Grill popped until the very end, and if I had to do it all over again, I would have moved these brats down very close to the fire for the last few minutes of cooking to crisp up the skin some more. Now compared to the brats on the solo stove, these skins still had some chew to them. And it's one of my least favorite things about brats. I don't like a chewy skin. If a natural casing doesn't pop when I take a bite, I'm not loving it. So that was a lesson that we learned for next time. Now we also cooked the same steak kebabs and I wanted to see how close I could get the outpost grill to the fire. And it turns out the answer is way too close. I charred the first side accidentally since I was cooking on two fire pits at once and it was easily remedied by moving the grate up to a better cooking height for the rest of the cook. Next up, let's cover the griddle tops. The solo stove griddle top is the same size as the grill top, just shy of 18 inches across, and it weighs about a half a pound less at 16 and a half pounds. The griddle top sits on top of the hub, just like the grill top, so it's a set distance from the fire at all times. We started with smash burgers on the griddle top and I was quite happy with the stability of the top when I was pushing down really hard to get the burgers as flat as possible. Since the top is made of cast iron, the sear is just fantastic. It reminds me of the sear that I got on the Masterbuilt Gravity 800 griddle top about a year ago when we tested that unit. Really happy with how it did for burgers. Now next up, we did half a pound of bacon for a breakfast with a family, and I started to notice the difference between the outside of the griddle and the center of the griddle when it came to temperature. The outside is generally about 100 degrees cooler than the middle when measured with our Thermoworks infrared thermometer, so we laid our bacon around the edge instead of across the middle, and I'm really glad we did. I was able to bring the bacon to temperature slowly like I do when I'm cooking on the range inside, and I didn't burn any of it by checking my hot zones first. At the end of the cook, there was a considerable grease pool around the outside of the griddle that I would have liked to drain, but it's really difficult to drain hot fat with this griddle. There's no notch to pour it, so just be aware that there's no place for grease to go when you cook on the griddle top. We followed the bacon with some brioche French toast and we stayed out of the bacon grease by putting five slices in the middle of the griddle. Now the fire was dying out so we didn't have any overheating issues, but we needed to add wood to finish the second side. And like we mentioned earlier, here's where we ran into fire management issues. It was hard to keep the temperature up where we wanted it and not overshoot. We wanted to warm the top up to try an over medium egg. So we added three small splits and the fire simply just got out of hand. 
We were dodging flames coming out over the griddle, so it became a game of cat and mouse trying not to get burned. We also tried chicken thigh fajitas and they were just dynamite. Peppers and onions on one side and chicken thighs on the other made me wish that I had a second hub so I could bring the entire griddle top over to the table and serve dinner on the sizzling griddle. We put some oil on the meat and veggies before they went on the grill and that made sure that we didn't experience any sticking on the cast iron. For the griddle on the Brio, we started with some smash burgers and I learned right away how close we were to the flames of the fire pit. I was smashing my second patty and got licked by the flame. Now note to self, if you're working on the sear plate griddle, uh, wear a glove probably. In the end, the burgers were great and I was happy with the sear that this unit put on the patties as well. Next up, we did a steak on the outpost grill for Melissa and I while we cooked grilled cheese on the sear plate for the kids. Even when you have the fire down at a reasonable level to grill over, it's still really hot for grilled cheese, but we made it work. Now, if you're wanting a nice crust on any kind of bread, this will put it on there for sure. We like to think what it would be like to take this unit camping as well, and a standard breakfast when we're on the go is egg in the hole, or egg in the eye as my family has called it for years. Now it's just buttered bread with an egg sized hole in the middle and it's toast and eggs in one dish at the campsite. Now you really need to get the fire down to coals before you put this one on though, or your toast will burn before the egg has a chance to cook through. When it comes time to clean the cooktops, here's what our experience has been like. It's best to clean each of these cooking surfaces as soon as they've cooled down. If you let them sit overnight or even for a few days, cleaning them gets much harder. For the solo stove grill top, we will usually let it cool to the point where we won't burn ourselves working with it. We'll take it to the sink in the outdoor kitchen and use the Lodge cast iron scrubby cleaner. Now it's a little rubberized sponge with some chain mail around it and it cleans off debris very well. Now we also picked up a stiff bristle brush that we use quite often and it'll get the food particles off really easily. Now, if I'm dealing with rust, I'll break out an SOS pad, but that means I'm re-seasoning everything. So I reserve that as a cleaning solution for when things get beyond what I can fix with a good coat of oil in time over the fire. Now, storage is a concern with all of these attachments because you're not always going to be using them every time you light a fire. The solo stove hub is the hardest thing to store out of the bunch because it's a large piece of stainless steel that doesn't fold or get any smaller. You can store it upside down inside the bonfire fire pit, but that's how we keep ours when we're not using it. But it just means that every time we pull out the bonfire for a fire, we have to take out the hub and find a place to store it before we put it back in storage when we're done. Now the cooking tops for solo stove encountered rust problems since we stored them outside in our outdoor kitchen. The grill top got the worst of it and we've reseasoned the grill multiple times trying to get rid of all the rust, but it keeps creeping back in after we cook. That's been annoying to say the least. They do offer a storage bag that's an additional cost and it keeps the top protected from the elements if you're going to store it outside. Now we ended up moving to a bag for the grill top since it was just being problematic. Now my suggestion would be to find a place in the garage, put a hook on the wall and hang it when you're not using it. Now that's what I'd suggest for the griddle top as well, and they could share a hook if it's strong enough. For Brio's outpost grill, I just store it in the garage on a nail board I have for hanging things. The outpost comes with a bag to store it in, and I just hang it on the wall in the bag. Now the griddle is another thing entirely since it's the heaviest accessory out of the bunch and has two folding handles to account for. I just found the notch in the griddle and set that towards the bottom and leaned it against the garage wall for the first month that we had it. I need to install a heavy duty wall anchor because it's in the way and I'm afraid one of the kids is going to trip over it. Now if you have great storage ideas for this Brio griddle, leave us a note in the comments section down below. So it's time for my overall thoughts on the two different cooking systems. First, let's talk about the grill. For me, the Brio Outpost grill beats out the solo stove grill top for two reasons. First, the ability to move it up and down, closer to or away from the fire at any time during the cook really changes how I can cook over a fire. It's Argentinian grilling over a fire pit and I'm a big fan. Now second, I like that the Outpost grill isn't cast iron. I haven't had any rust issues with the outpost and I have with the solo stove grill top. Now for those two reasons, the Brio wins the grill top head to head for me. Now for the griddle. 
Putting these two units head to head is closer, but I think Solo Stove has the edge here. After I burned myself making burgers on the Brio, I realized that I felt safer using the griddle on the Solo Stove. So safety is the first reason I'd give Solo Stove the win here. Secondly, cooking things like fried rice, fajitas, and similar dishes with smaller elements is at home on the Solo Stove and much more difficult on the Brio. Having a whole griddle top to work with is much more like the griddle that we use in the outdoor kitchen. The circular griddle is a fun novelty that works for whole proteins, but it's not ideal for me with some of the griddle meals that are my favorites. Overall, it's a split decision for me on this one. I'd rather have the Brio grill with the Solo Stove griddle for a complete cooking system. Now, side note, you could actually use the Brio Outpost grill with the Solo Stove uh, because you could stab it into the ground if you're using it in the grass, but just an idea there. Now, that's my opinion, and now you get to decide for yourself which cooking system makes more sense for you and why. Tell us in the comments section below because I'd love to hear what you think and how either of these could work for you. Now, if you'd like to check on the current price on the Solo Stove or Brio models that we've used today, we have all of the links for you in the description. So give those a click and you can find out the current price and see if there are any sales going on to take advantage of. Over on the barbecuelab.com website, we have a whole section on our favorite tips and tricks when cooking with a fire pit. So check out that link below to get our top tips for fire pit cooking. Now they'll change the way that you cook around a live fire for the better. Now, if outdoor cooking is your thing, consider subscribing to the channel. It's just one click to make sure that you stay up to date with the best in outdoor cooking. And hitting that notification bell just means that you won't have to come hunting for us to find new videos. You'll be notified when a new video is up. And we think that makes you one of the coolest people on the planet. Now, if you're on social media, we're on all of the channels. Pick your favorite, type in the barbecue lab and let's connect. There's links below to find us on each of the social networks. So with all of those links to click, this description is just bursting with opportunities. Head on over and get to clicking. I'm David from the Barbecue Lab, and I'll see you next time.